Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, Engine Bearing Failures with Dan Bagley. I am Amanda Harmoning. I'm an admin assistant here at AERA, and I will be moderating today's event with my colleague, Rob Monroe. Hey, everyone. Yeah, Rob Monroe here. I look after membership and technical development over at AERA. And uh, Steve and Chuck, they're both techs here at AERA, and, and they, they do the podcast. Uh, I know the last one was really, really good. Uh, episode 12, Steve and Chuck discussed anything related to torque plates and torque plate honing. So that's really worth checking out. And uh, I know they're working on episode 13 right now as well. So just go to our website. You'll see there's a podcast tab right when you go to the website. You'll be able to click right on it. You'll see it right from the home screen. So Dan Bagley is from Mall Aftermarket. And Dan is the performance sales engineer there at Mollet, and he has spent most of his career in the racing industry. So Dan is a wealth of information. We use him in, on our, in the tech department all the time. We're always sending him images and photos and having him dissect, uh, you know, what, what, what's going wrong and what's happening. And really looking forward to this webinar. Um, Dan is, like I say, his failure analysis, uh, he spends a lot of time looking at bearings. So um, Dan, I want to welcome you, and uh, how's it going today? Rob, I appreciate it. Um, it's going great today, and I thank everybody for taking time out of their busy schedule, and uh, hopefully you'll learn something today, or uh, if you have any questions as, as this goes on, like Rob said, feel free to, to you know chat them in there, and at the end, I'll have my email address likewise, so if there's any follow-throughs or anything, uh, people will know how to get a hold of me, so um, appreciate you having me on. Thank you. So just so everybody knows, we're talking bearing failure analysis. So a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm the performance sales engineer for Molly. Uh, my background, as you can see there, is as I was been racing pretty well my entire life. A uh, long time ago, I've had a passion for engines, and I've, I've never checked up on that. It's always been a, my interest and my my passion. Uh, I worked 27 years in NASCAR engine shops and various shops, and including four years I had my own engine shop that I ran. Um, the last 13 years before I came to work at Molly, I was at Roush Yates Racing Engines, and uh, the last nine of those, they they took my tools away, and I became the reliability specialist because of my experience of the years of building engines and understanding and testing and uh, you know what happened. So <clears throat> the I also had six years of Jasper engines and transmissions and uh, five years of automatic transmission rebuild. So uh, it's just a little bit about me. Um, I'm, I am an engine guy. I came to Mali uh, a few years ago and to help develop products. So one of the things we're going to uh, review, we're going to go over the bearing performance categories. Uh, some of it's the, the surface behavior, surface actions of the bearing. Um, we're going to go the slipperiness. Uh, the ability to minimize friction while sliding over the journal without causing wear to either surface. Really, it's the seizure resistance. Uh, you know, there's different overlays. Uh, we're, we're not going to go over a lot of the overlays. And I, I did a presentation, and you can you can go back to ARA and check it out. I think it was last fall on the bearing fundamentals and design. So a lot of what I'm talking about, if you were in that session, you're going to pick up some more if you haven't been there, I highly recommend you go uh, check out ARA's website and 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 find that because there's uh, some uh, pretty good meat and potatoes as far as bearing designs in there. So the the other thing we talk about with the surface behavior of a bearing and knowing what gets is embeddability, and that's simply the ability to absorb dirt, particles, whatever it may be in the bearing surface, and not creating an issue on the engine performance. And then conformability, uh, you have to have a bearing that can conform, which allows the bearing to break in. There's some engines have more uh, crank flex, some have block flex, um, rod flex, whatever it may be, that you have a bearing that's conformable enough to, to withstand what that engine needs so you get the life out of that engine. So then we also talk about the the performance categories. Uh, what what is what are we looking for as far as load carrying, uh, the will the ability to withstand the engine operating loads for long periods. You know what what is the purpose of this engine, and you know what bearings do we need for that? <clears throat> Fatigue strength. Um, again, 
you know, my other webinar we did, we talked about different overlays, uh, fatigue strength and the lining to resist crack and flaking and their cyclic loads imposed by the dynamics. So different engines have different dynamics. What's, what's going on with the engine? Uh, horsepower, uh, torques, flex again. So, and one of the things that's often underrated was corrosion resistance. Uh, as, as engines create acids from the oils of not changing all or they, you know, different things happen and, and different oils, and I'm not definitely not an oil guy, um, <clears throat> but there's different acids that can affect the, the actual bearing itself and can weaken the material. So those are things we have to be concerned about as in designing bearings and what their purpose is. So we have different properties, uh, the thermal properties. So the temperature resistance, the ability to maintain all the properties at operating temperatures, uh, you know, it's a big deal. What What is the, when we design a bearing, what is it for? And if you change to a different bearing when you're rebuilding the engine, you know, how does that affect it? Uh, these are all things that you, know, we, you have to concern yourself with if, if you're changing out. Uh, thermal conductivity, basically that's, you have to, you have to get heat away from the bearing surface, um, plain and simple. You know, you, you have oil there to, to dissipate the heat. You have, um, you know, what temperatures are go, is it going to run at? Uh, there's different nomenclature out there as far as what's, uh, what can happen, you know, on, on, on my computer, I have a sticky note and I have every temperature breakdown of every component in a bearing and I always reference that um, so if you if you certain engines create an oil temperature but if that oil temperature breaks down you you create higher friction when you create higher friction on the bearing you create bearing temperature and the bearing is only as good as the the lowest melting point component in the overlay so if your friction temperature comes up by uh, having poor oil or losing oil film or something like that, and you create friction temperature on the bearing, that's that's as good as your bearing is going to be. Okay, because once the once the bent the temperature exceeds the limitations of the material compound of the overlay or substrate, mostly it's the overlay. At that point, you you have you have failure mode. So. The important thing to note that anything above a critical temperature of lubrication oil is catastrophic, no matter what the material is. So if, if you're thinking, well, I'm gonna put this bearing in, realize that surface temperature of that bearing is, is definitely a limiting factor. So premature bearing failures. This is um, just a, a, our analysis of root cause failures. Uh, as you can see, the the common by far is dirt, and we'll, we'll leave dirt as there's a lot of different dirts that we can contamination. Dirt may be a, a poor name. Uh, there's different things, and we'll go over some of those that you'll see. Uh, but definitely, the the number one failure that we see is is contamination. Uh, next that is misassembly, and that again, that's another why open. Did you? There's some different assembly errors. There could be oil clearance errors, um, things like that. Misalignment, insufficient lubrication, uh, overloading, and then corrosion. I mentioned corrosion, but as you can see, it's that's not that common. Um, a lot of times, the corrosion is a is a secondary because there may have been some contamination in the oil and that create corrosion or sometimes it's just plain neglect. So we're gonna discuss some normal bear, normal wear patterns, excuse me. Um, so the normal wear pattern should be centered and covered between two thirds to three quarters of the bearing surface. So as you can see right here, we have the, where the arrows are, that is the normal wear pattern that would be typically of what you would want to see. So what we don't want 
is the normal wear pattern to extend always to the parting lines. Um, again, if you, when we talk about bearing geometry, there's a bore relief out there on the sides and, and that's the widest part of the bearing and that's to accept for um, cap misalignment, um, cap shift, things like that to happen. So if your bearing wear would exceed and get all the ways into the this area of where the bore area is, that would be that would be definitely an issue that you're you're getting too wide of a wear pattern. Okay, so uh, foreign particles again is when I was talking about dirt, I was talking about foreign particles, um, blasting media. We we have the the image down the right. Somebody's cleaning up their uh, block, making it look all nice, and there's glass beads, steel shot, walnuts, whatever your preferred blasting media may be. Uh, it's not not advisable in, in because you, what you cannot get is all those particles out. Uh, carbon. So when you, when you get the media in there, you get the carbon, and right here's a here's a microscopic view of a bearing that has a, a chunk of carbon in it, and we'll go over that the effects that that piece is going to have in there. Um, so we have the lubrication, deterioration, starvation. Basically, when that um, the issue with that carbon in there at that point you can see where the debris line goes in there so you, at, at that point you're you're creating a problem where the debris is is ruining your oil film which is going to make create problems with the the bearing as far as the oil film you can see it's definitely polished there and it's just not conducive to go um, so we have the foreign particles and we all, we all know this guy I, I, there's a little video here and unfortunately it's it's not it's very sketchy how it's it's coming across there but we always have the uh, metallic wear we have the the guy honing um in frame you know he's sitting there and has his drill going and just not really a good way to clean out that at all and what happens is you end up with this abrasive, the honing, the, the grinding material, the polishing, you know, different things, airborne, if in the environment, then air ingested, whatever the, the abrasive may be air ingested via what's coming through the engine. Um, on the right, you can see this is a microscopic view of a bearing that has debris from honing grit going through it. So there's a, you can actually see the particle in there. We talked about the embeddability. The, the embedded particles displaces the bearing. You can see on the, on the picture here, you can see right there, there's a, there's a piece of embeddability. Now, if you look right inside there, you can see the journal. Uh, below my pointer there, you can see the bearing itself and there's the oil film. Well, you can see it closed up that oil film. So you're, you're taking the oil wedge and you're disturbing it, which is what's causing it to lose its oil film, which is a, will cause a premature failure. Um, it's it's restricting it. And if we look here at the next slide, you can actually see uh, a particulate that's inside the bearing that raises it up and creates this this problem with the debris putting in and taking up the oil space. So there's a little uh, another view of it, or that's a different piece. But um, if you look at that one close, you can actually see off of the particulate, there is a part where the it's changing colors. It's actually removing the overlay because of exactly that. At that point, the the oil wedge is gone. So it, it was up to that point and the, the, that Basically, if you have a river and you have a, a, a stick or something in the middle of it, the water has to go around it. The same thing happens with the oil. It's going to have to go around there. And at that point, and when you're under load, it cannot fit itself back underneath your load. So you're writing a journal on the bearing itself. So we have the bearing surface heavily embedded with foreign particles. And if you notice, you can see on there, uh, you can see the, the the light scratches that are 
that are going through there. Basically, it's, it's a very small micron amount of debris going through there. It's not heavy. There's some there's some pretty good spots in there, um, but it's it's heavy scratching going on. The bigger view of it of the debris that's a 40 time mi microscope view. Um, and basically, when you get the smaller particles like that, a smaller micron, it, it creates more of a lapping and not at one big chunk, but just a lapping where you'll get a lot of small serrations going through the bearing. And it, it's able to embed, let's go back to the bearing design, it's able to embed some of the part particulates. Uh, but keep in mind, every time you embed particulates, it, it's affecting how that oil wedge is working on the bearing or the, the lack of ability for it to work. So when we blow it up a little bit more to a thousand, uh, that those some of those little particulates were basically silicone carbide grit from a honestone. Uh, very common. So you know block cleanliness is is a huge factor in the the dirt debris because uh, the the silicone that you use to hone cylinders or main bores or anything like that. Uh, lifter boards are are extremely hard, and they're designed exactly that to to remove material. So the the foreign particle trap behind the, the bearing uh, that that kind of goes to you can cross that as a debris, but it's also usually it's that's a assembly issue in many cases. And if you look, there's a there's a cross view of the bearing and the particulates in there. And then see this explaining exactly what I was talking about where it's creating an, um, a diversion in the oil film. This being a side view, you can see exactly how the oil would be coming up. And it, once it hits that, it has to detour, which would create an issue of the losing the, the oil film wedge. And so this caused localized overload friction, heat, and initiate bearing failure. Again, and when you when you lose the oil film by a piece of debris or something like that, remember the bearing can only withstand the thermal temperature of the lowest melting point ingredient in the overlay. So in 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 some cases, if it's a copper tin lead bearing, the lowest melting point is 10, uh, 449 degrees Fahrenheit. So once you get a temperature on that bearing of that that reaches that, you're starting to melt the, the components out of the bearing overlay. So that, yeah, there's a, two angles the same. Um, so that here's what the bearing looks like on the backside. It probably isn't this particular one, but you can see on the right there, there's a there's just a little small shaving. Maybe it came off a workbench or something like that when somebody was assembling it. But the uh, repercussions of that on the inside, when it's creating a point onto the shaft, uh, it, it actually has worn the overlay out, which the overlay is is roughly around a thousandths thick, plus or minus, depending on the bearing itself. So it's not that much to wear, and you can see the substrate, which is the the bronze underneath it, that's being exposed because of that one little piece. So then we have the the foreign particulates. Here's uh, some steel blasting shot trapped behind a bearing, and you can see that the that's basically the same would be the same result as the picture where it's creating interference and make the bearing go inward into the the the, the journal itself and create an issue with uh, the oil clearance. So this is um, you see this kind of commonly um, and and it doesn't doesn't always mean it's bad but you get the contamination from the breakdown of the oil additive. Uh, basically when your oil, some of the newer vehicles in, uh, you can run the oils for 100,000 miles, whatever it is. It doesn't, sometimes it's still, the, the oil can become acidic. And the picture on the left is just what it visually looks like. If you look at that, it's actually really nice because you on the top part of it, uh, you can see the right there's the bore relief, so it's it's really nice looking, uh, doing wear. But all this grayish color stuff is contamination from breakdown of the oil additive. Um, the 
the graph there on the right is the is spectrum graph of the picture on the top right. And you can see the baseline is right here, but you can see all right here, that pit right in there with the high levels going out, that's actually removing overlay. So what, what's going on there is because of the, the oil breaking down, you're removing the overlay. And uh, as I said many times, bearings don't self heal. So once it's gone, it's gone. Uh, you're creating an oil issue. We have the accelerated wear. Um, you know, the, the wall thickness is reduced. Uh, I'm not sure what in this particular bearing, what's going on here in, in this area right here. Um, I'm not familiar with that particular one, but the bearing is, is worn. There's no evidence of heat. There's no particles. The bearing just has a lot of wear. So there's a couple things that could be going on with this bearing. Uh, one being if, if the crankshaft was ground uh, or polished and was had too much of the, uh, what we would call the, the fuzz of the, the journal would be very rough and then turning in the rotation that uh, does, if the fuzz was going the wrong way, it would actually create little grinding wheels per se. And those would go through because the, the microns or the, the oil wedge is, is sometime in heavy load can only be maybe a thousandths um, or a tenth of a thousandths thick, excuse me, totally wrong there, uh, a tenth of a thousand thick of oil film to, to get the bearing off the journal. It's very, very small. So if you have particles in the crank because of the way the crank was polished or the way the direction it was polished or the, the way it was ground, you actually can have fuzz that would be higher and lower. And you can, you can measure it with an, a profilometer and try to come up with, well, what is the RA? But it doesn't necessarily is not gonna pick up all the little fuzz particles of burrs that are sticking out of the crank. Um, the other thing can go something like this here with just a lot of wear, which is be dirty oil, uh, very small microns of debris that would just, again, be a lapping compound that would, uh, would not be, would be breaking through and, and, and the, the overlay and causing it to just be polished and, and wear. Um, you know, how bad it is question, would question how long that the, the bearing would actually function. Um, you know, it, it's, you may not, it may be cosmetic, but not as much dimensional change that it, it's, it still may function. Again, I don't know what this contamination is here. I uh, can't explain that one at all. So then we have the misalignment um, you know, when you're when you're putting the, the bearing in and, and missing the the locating tang uh, into the the lug itself into the the tang into the journal. So this is especially important in, when you're doing a frame rolling installation. Um, when I'm not sure this video is going to play, but uh, when when they when they actually roll the bearing in, you're doing an in-frame and you're having to roll the bearing in. It's very important to to make sure that that bearing tang is in alignment and not holding pinching that bearing off. Because if it does pinch it off, um, you know it definitely could create an issue where it's going to restrict that oil flow. And and, and as as big as the uh, hang and movement that is, it's definitely going to be pinching the crankshaft, which would cause a, a, a bigger issue. So, and then we have the misassembly. Um, make sure that the oil hole is in line with the block. Uh, I know that sounds pretty basic, but uh, particularly on the, on the events of doing in frames and uh, rolling bearings in something like that. It's it's sometimes it's easy to to get that bearing in the wrong direction and your oil hole be be opposite and obviously not feeding. Here's a prime example of one. Um, you can see the witness marks of the oil hole. Uh, 
going in there. Uh, the bearing on the right actually is a bearing that was not rotated completely and it just missed the hole because the bearings, the parting lines were not where they needed to be, which ended up putting the oil hole in, in no man's land. So oil starvation, uh, you know, the, again, the normal oil thickness, you know, you're two tenths uh, under heavy load. Again, you're, you're at a, a tenth um, of oil clearance. So oil starvation is, is, is huge. Um, more, more issues than not, we're having oil starvations of just, again, creating a, uh, a problem with uh, the overlay getting of higher temperature. So this is a this is the some pictures I have more coming up here uh, of wiping distress. You can see that there there's a significantly amount of wiping. Uh, would would think that there's may or may not be some microscopic debris in there. Uh, some of this might you can see some some. Uh, right in in the middle there, right in there, uh, you can see some debris that looks like it may have been some of that can be self-induced by the bearing itself and creating a, a, an issue where it looks like there's some contamination, but it actually might be the bearing it destroying itself and rolling the materials in there. Um, this is an interesting bearing here. The bottom one. So if you look on the on the on the upper part of, I cannot move my my sorry my my little pointer is not working real well. Uh, if you look at the upper part above where my red dot is, that's the overlay, and it looks basically right. That's how it would be. But below that, you see there's a significant amount of of wear, right to the right of where my pointer is there, you can see the black. Uh, that's that's very interesting to me because again, when you take the components out of the overlay, and again, if the, the temperature of the tin would be melting, that's when you start seeing the black. So basically below the red dot um, is what's already melted and it's starting to smear. You can see that by you look over at the bore relief, you can see how this overlay is smearing all the way out to the bore relief. So this is initially where the failure was, and it was caused by the the components melting, which is the significance of color right there. And you can see it below right there. You can see the dark color, and that is where it's not quite as hot as what the melting point was, where it was smearing the overlay, but that's, it's going that direction. In much, if this bearing ran much longer, it would be a, it would be a complete failure. Now this particular one was probably still running, oil clearance was opening up, uh, it was losing wedge, which at that point it's creating, by losing the oil film, it is, it's the, the whole bearing it's snowballing it's it's becoming a catastrophic failure because it's melting itself out so here's here's a better case of the the analysis of the the bearing to overlay and as you can see here's a clear picture of it's smearing and this is just low oil i had an oil breakdown of some part of, of the wedge and you're smearing the the overlay into the bore relief, which should have enough space. You should never have contact there. Here's a here's a clear picture of exactly what I was talking about earlier. Um, there's the you can see the discolorations. You can see the stages of the breakdown of that bearing. The the dark being it's sweating some of the the components out of the overlay. Uh, down to you see some bronze substrate in there, which would be indications that it's already gone through the overlay, and down to the lower portion of the bearing where the bearing actually looks fully functional. All right, so this this is a um, a slide, and there it is. Okay, so we all have the I have a serious delay on my 
on my computer, my again, my apologies. Um, the oil contamination, this is um, the fuel system or internal oil leaks. We, we've hopefully not seen this before, but we know it's out there, right? Uh, where people don't change their oil and you get this heavy gunk. Uh, this bearing right here is just simply, it had lubric it had oil, but the oil is such poor quality that it's, you can see the load, it's basically exactly riding in the percentages we were talking about earlier. Uh, but you can just see it's heavier in the in this in the center at the load point of the bearing. And it's the oil is just not lubricating enough to, to keep the bearing cool. So another another failure is a hot short delamination. Um, this the I, I, a quick story. The first time I saw this was when I was racing in NASCAR, and there was a red flag condition, and the, they had to shut the cars off, and immediately the um, fix picked up the debris, got the cars going, had two laps to finish. It was at Pocono. I remember it very well. Um, the engine came back, and this is not the bearing, but this is exactly what it looked like. It completely had taken the overlay off of the bearing and um, it's gone. It just, it, the, the crankshaft was, had so much thermal temperature in there that it completely melted the overlay off the bearing and it adhered to the crank. Once the engine fired back up again, it, it completely just smeared all of the overlay off of it. And you could tell that it was still, the bearing was good because there's there's still the the substrate is still adhered to the steel backing but the issue there was that there's a thermal temperature that exceeded the melting point of the overlay and rotation just pulls it off now it doesn't necessarily have to have rotation to do that um, you can melt the substrate off and i'm sorry melt the overlay off and leaving the substrate this particular one was ran a period of time because you can notice that the chunks are missing out of it in the um, so you you know it was ran for a period of time after so this is a good picture of a, a hot chart delamination right here um, again you can see that uh, bearings basically the debris that you see speckled on them is is the it's feeding itself debris, the bearings are feeding themselves debris, so it's just getting everywhere in there uh, contamination. But uh, again, you can see the bronze in the in the center two bearings that is still there. They should still show adhesion. Obviously there's chunks missing, but the, the thermal temperature that that got, keep in mind that the uh, lead in, in the substrate is lead also. So uh, lead melts at 621 degrees. So the frictional the temperature in there, if you start at 621 degrees, it's starting, the lead's going to pull out. When when that happens, you you will pull chunks of the substrate out. Now, the amount of lead in the bearing are where it's at and proportion-wise, if, if it is a centered bearing, which again is on a, another web, webinar, the centered bearing can have larger chunks of lead in there, so it's easier to pull that out than a cast bearing, which would be uh, Clevite's performance bearings. So this is a another condition that can happen where you can have bent connecting rods. Um, not going to go in with the the pin bore in that area. Obviously, that it, it will show there as well. But if you look at the uh, the bearings itself, you can see right above my pointer there, it, you can see the, the little pie shape that is, is going on. Um, the bearing, bearing is, is side loading and not, the bearing side loaded and it's not being able to hold it in position. Now, from time to time, you can, uh, you can see some funny wears with, with engine misalignment, and you can mistake with what we would, what I see in some of the racing applications, where you have actually have it loaded on one side as the picture shows, um, 
you you can actually get that with a combustion that would push the rod to one side. Maybe the rod isn't bent, but that'd be on some high performance engines where you'll load one corner of the bearing more because of the amount of combustion and the cylinder pressure and which will force the rod to, to angle. Uh, but the, the, the common shapes uh, with polishing cranks you can get out of shape journals with taper, hourglass and barrel shape there. It's, it's important to know what, what's going on there. Again, if you're, if you're not having a performance engine, then usually it's, if you see something like this, it would look, um, it would be very much checking the crank. The other thing is you can, on certain applications if, in performance wise, we have, a, we have a thing with crank flex and uh, that's can be very similar um, where the crank is flexing, which will cause it to load on one spot on, on, on a main web. And it can be very interesting. And I have some more pictures of that here in a little bit that would kind of represent that better. Um, a twisted connecting rod. If you look there, you can, you can see the angle. You can see the wear pattern. It's not straight up and down the bearing. It's actually at an angle. So the, the bearing itself is, is twisting and the the main thing is check is is the is the crank is is everything straight um you know we like to see a thousands measured over a distance of six inches um if you have bent components obviously you're going to get so you're going to get wear and bearing wear that's similar to this so using a straight edge a feeler gauge check the main bore alignment um you know we, we would like to see the bores within the thousands for all adjacent bores, two thousands overall, and a thousands for overall diesels. Uh, diesels have a significantly higher uh, cylinder pressure, so things can things can show up there a little differently. So this is this is the the picture um, misalignment. Um, it's two different bearings, but you can see that the the misalignment and and the wear the what's happening, uh, how much more wear you have in different locations because of of misalignment. Now, one thing I was referencing before is is if you get high performance engines, you can get crank flex, which would sh can show similar wears where it might show on one main one side and then the, the next main on the, the side closest to it where the crank actually is 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 creating a flex a whip which is I, I see very very commonly on on that applications performance applications and so a simple thing as as far as checking it a crankshaft or out around uh, putting it in V blocks and rotate the shaft to center run out center uh, with a dial indicator. And again, we the run out should not exceed two thousands for light duty vehicles and thousands for heavy loaded. So this is a uh, a lot of the the bearings that we're coming out. People ask and, and the the part number and the suffix. There's an N, which would stand for narrowed. Um, the crankshafts are a lot of the crankshafts coming in. The newer crankshafts, their their aftermarket are one to increase radiuses, and to me it makes a lot of sense because the radius is is the um, the the connector that helps connect the crank to the the uh, the radius, the journal, and the more gusset you can put in there, the stronger the crank is and the less flex it has. That's that's great. Um, you know, I have. A lot of discussions with crank manufacturers. They they want to put as much radius in there, and I'm saying, well, I need a I need surface area to make sure my bearing doesn't walk. So we go round and round, but we've compromised on several, and and you have we've came up with a narrow bearing. But you can see on these bearings, if you look on the edge, you can see that they're edge loading, and when they edge load. You, you're, there's a couple things that happen. You're, you're creating a, an issue. You're creating heat in the bearing. Uh, another thing from a, if, if the contact is, is too much and it's very heavy, uh, 
you, you actually can be creating a stress riser in the crankshaft itself. Uh, I was in charge of the non-destructive testing on the, in the NASCAR for nine years. And a lot of the cracks that propagated from cranks came out of the radius, specifically when there was any kind of contact with a bearing and it uh, would change and put a pit or a groove per se in that radius. And that would be the, the crack propagation point. We would document uh, a groove. And the next time that engine came back from a race, you would see that groove went to a, a hairline crack and at that point the crank was junk. And it and somebody simply came down to exactly what this picture is here, where you, you have contact and it's creating a, um, uh, some interference, which creates a stress point on the crankshaft. So uh, several things can happen. Also, you're you're inducing more thermal temperature into the bearings by having that contact, which then goes back to melting out the overlay and having a premature failure. So the stress cycles. If if you have a piece of metal, kind of like what's shown here, uh, the more the more you bend it, and that the material will bend and eventually it, it fatigues. As you can see right there, uh, again, the video is not very good, but you can see, and we all did this, we bend stuff on enough that it finally gets hot and, and it breaks. Um, you know, there it is, it's finally broke off. So the this is a picture of a, a bearing that had a lot going on with it and when when the I'm again overlay a, two pictures there um, when when overloading a bearing over and over and over uh, this video is not going to show I don't believe but but you basically will create there it is it's that it wasn't a good video because it's 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 just jumpy uh, but you're going to get crack propagation into the bearing itself, and eventually you're going to lose a chunk of the bearing. If you remember the picture of that bearing, there was chunks missing out of it. So when that bearing is flexing as much as it is, you 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 cause you cause crack propagations through the substrate, and eventually those cracks will be big enough that it can remove a chunk. So sometimes you get an engine you get an engine back and you look at it and say, wow, you know, this this chunk is missing out of this bearing. What happened? Well, a lot of times it can be the fact that you had cracking into the substrate and it doesn't give you a visual on the outside, but it's substrate uh, that is cracking. And then once your substrate's cracks enough around it, it loses contact, it loses adhesion in the bottom and and bang, the chunk comes out. So that can happen. Now, again, you, you see that with a lot of crank flex. Uh, if you if you add any kind of power adders or even just increasing the, the power level on a particular engine above the stock and you don't look at different bearing designs, you can create this same phenomenon that happens. So, Overloading a trimail bearing can result in fatigue. Um, again, the overlay is just, it's a thousand stick. Um, so these, these conditions look a lot worse than what they really are with the exception of the top left one. The top left one uh, has a lot of discoloration in there. Um, that he, he's, he's hurting pretty bad. Um, he, he's, he's obviously hurting for oil, uh, it's discoloration. Uh, the right one, uh, this, this particular bearing is, has a lot of fatigue in it. Uh, I'm, it's not at failure mode. It's showing that the bearing is working. The bearing is, is moving around and absorbing the crank torsionals that are going on, um, absorbing the, the firing that's going on and life is, you know, it's, it's working. The bearing is working. These bearings here, this, this is a, a perfect example of um, the center bearing. This is why I was talking about crank flex. What I'm seeing on this bearing is, if you notice to the right and the left, there is fatigue. In the center, there isn't. Okay, so I can come from two things. Uh, 
it can come from it. If you get a little bit of it, um, the, the overlay will kind of fill itself back in. Um, I don't think that's the case on this one uh, based off the, the, the number two and the number four bearing have a lot of fatigue and it diminishes from out to the one and five. Uh, to me, it looks like there's a, some center crank going on on the number two, some crank flex going on on the number two and the number four, and it's coming in angling in to be stabilized by the number three main bearing um, is what I see if you, if you, hopefully you're understanding what I'm trying to say, because there's a lot of fatigue here and then it's edge loading here. Again, I cannot keep my pointer where it needs to be. It's edge loading there. Um, and the, the crank is, when it's firing, the crank is, to me, is giving me some crank flex uh, stories that I, I believe is happening there. You also see it, it's, it's flexing here and it's doing the same thing on this side and likewise always over here on the front one. So in that, in that case, you know, I would, I would, think there's possibly was somebody added some power to the uh, this engine and the the crank is is flexing around and creating some fatigue on brain again uh, that bearing is not at a failure mode it's it's telling it's all parts will tell you what's going on you just have to know how to read it and that's telling me that there's some crank flex going on with that one uh, let's see the intermediate, intermediate layer fatigue. Um, this is again something. It, this is a good indication of the substrate, as you can see on the bottom part of the picture. I mean, there's a big chunk missing. Um, there's there's things happening on this here that are are creating fractures into the substrate because the bearing itself looks pretty good. It's losing chunks out of it, and and kind of like the the animation was showing a little bit where you you're you're cracking from the overlay into the substrate and eventually a chunk is going to be coming out of it all right crush um crush is a big thing again this was discussed on the the previous webinar i encourage you to look at that um each bearing all bearings are made and the bearing itself is a little longer than the 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 length of the bore it's fitting in so basically you you have a, um, a a small amount of over overstand we call it to hold the bearing in place uh, the bearing is, is is not held in by tangs the tangs are strictly locating tangs and in a lot of the newer applications they're not even they're not even on the bearings there's no locator tangs on them but they are strictly locators but if you look at the picture on the bottom right, the back side of the bearing, you can see some fretting going on there. Um, you know, basically when the, the pressure is not enough, the bearing starts to walk around. Uh, and when the bearing starts to walk around, it will fret on the back side. Um, high horsepower, uh, high frequencies, uh, high torsionals. Um, we've, we have, I've already had occasions on high horsepower with aluminum versus cast blocks that that can change because of thermal growth of the aluminum versus thermal growth of the cast. Um, so I've, I've redesigned some bearings to fit to accommodate the growth of aluminum. So all these can have a bearing on, uh, no pun there, uh, have an effect on the the crush of the the bearing that it it won't stay put where it needs to be. So you can have a couple issues. So, you know, I, I do not recommend ever honing a bore to achieve the oil clearance you want um, or making it smaller to achieve the clearance you want. Uh, and these are extreme cases right here, uh, but you can, you can see where the bearing has standoff, and if if you can't get enough hoop strength to go out, the bearing will actually buckle. Uh, the picture on the bottom right, you can see where it actually buckled at the weakest point, which would be right there at the hole. Um, the the bearing on the the upper left uh, it is pretty well like the one in the picture, where it buckled at the parting line. 
So if you if you try to tighten up and you go to a, the specification of the housing board where it's uh, smaller than recommended, you you risk this of of the bearing needing to have space and there's just no space, so the bearing will actually buckle. So and then we have the the fretting. There's a there's a picture of a, a bearing. You can see that the uh, the bearing has a lot of fretting on the back of it, um, and it's due to movement. I mean, the bearing that that particular one was um, just didn't have not did not have enough crush in there. So um, if you don't have enough crush, the bearing is is one to rotate. Um, so there's the this was talking about earlier. It actually creates a radial pressure that pushes out to hold the bearing in place. Uh, if that radial pressure is is not enough, you get the 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 bearing one to walk. If the bearing if the radial pressure is too much, you get where the bearing wants to wants the you know it's not going to hold. So there's there's a couple things that go on. So that's why we have a specifications of a, a min max that we want that housing board to be. And that's because we have a, a database that we put all these, what the material is, what the the material of the component, the block or rod, whatever it might be. And we, we know how much pressure it's gonna to take to hold that bearing and to keep it from, from moving or to keep it from buckling. So that's all in, in our design of, of designing a bearing and knowing what it's going to take to make that happen. So that concludes what I have on slides. Um, I'm open for any questions that you may have sent in. If you have anything that you feel that you know we you would like to discuss with me further down the road, uh, I very commonly get pictures of people sending me bearings uh, on my email and kind of hey, what do you think is going on here? Uh, what can we do to fix it? Is you know, am I using the right bearing? Um, so I'm I'm I try to help as many people as possible. Uh, I love this aspect of my job to be able to help people to uh, from my experiences or from the engineering at Mala or the whatever resources I can get to to help you as a as a engine builder out. So uh, with that being said, Rob, um, we can go from there. Sure. Yeah, no, great presentation, Dan. Um, you can definitely see uh, just how important choosing the right bearing app, you know, for the application, um, you know, especially even if you're not in the performance world, you know, with a lot of the start-stop technology and, and a lot of these engines are producing so much power, uh, choosing the right bearing is super critical. So, um, it's, and, you know, all of your pictures and images and everything were uh, there's uh, this is all stuff that we see that we're always in the shop trying to figure out so great job I appreciate it for sure oh I thoroughly enjoyed it thank you <laughs> now we do have some questions um, sure. so um, the one gentleman um, touched base a couple times on the uh, on the hot short you know when you had those slides up on, on with talking yes. about hot short and um, what it will do is uh, um, we'll forward your information because he wanted you to go more in depth on that. So I'll, I'll forward that information to you so that maybe you and him can chat directly. But the one thing he did ask was, uh, can housing bores shrink because of a hot short condition? Not necessarily for um, I, not necessarily from the hot short condition uh, because the hot short condition comes from the shaft being excessively hot and creating heat going into the bearing and the overlay which is the 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 highest or the lowest melting point right because you got the overlay you have the substrate and then you have a steel backing on a tri-metal or aluminum and steel um so normally it doesn't affect the housing bore that much uh what can affect the housing bore specifically if you have a new engine is is cyclic time whereas the the first time out the the engine may take set per se and you may take an, a block back, uh, specifically blocks, um, because they're cast, um, and, you, and a block would come back, and that that housing board dimension may change. Uh, you know, 
going back to the NASCAR side and stuff myself, uh, you know, we used to try to run a new block somewhere as a test, which is kind of counterproductive if you think about it at first, but we will run it to get the cycle, the heat cycles through it for the block to make, take set and then hone it. And it would actually make more power on the second build than it did the first because everything took a set and it maintained that shape. And from there on, it would pretty well say, but um, n normally no. Okay, all right. Um, and this is kind of a two-part question. And uh, they've asked, you know, how often should they flush the engine to keep the engine bearings clean and the engine internal parts clean? And uh, they've also asked it to kind of follow up, you know, do, do, you, do you generally recommend engine oil flushing and what are the best practices for engine oil flushing? Uh, engine oil flushing is very difficult because the bottom line is you can flush, but uh, you, you, you will not get all the heavy particulates out of the bottom of the oil pan uh, without risking something that you don't really want in your engine. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a bigger fan of maintain, maintaining proper intervals and, you know, just because, and this is not a jab at any of the OEMs, but um, just because they tell you you can run this long, uh, a lot of the oils are not not running that long uh, before they start to chemically break down. Uh, I'm, I'm still kind of old school. I like to change my oil more frequently and not have to get contaminants out much. Now, if you have a customer that has that, uh, where they have, uh, they've ran it and you, you've had heavy oil, you know, that's a different case scenario. It's not your own vehicle. Uh, at that point, you know, is you, if you, you may have to go with something. I, I'm just not a big fan, particularly because I know a lot of the cleaning chemicals are very harsh on overlays and different, they, they cause other issues. You may solve one issue, but you're creating another issue. Um, so the answer, I, I, you know, I like to change oil. If, if in doubt, change the oil, again, bearings don't repair themselves. So if you can flush out with oil, and maybe sh shorten up the next oil change to try to get some of the the the, the crud out of there might be the best case solution because they they'll never repair themselves once it's gone the material is gone never to be seen again. All right, super Dan. Um, another question for you: What in te what engine temperatures will cause catastrophic failure to the engine bearings and engine internals if not well handled by the engine oil? Again, there's, um, I'm not an oil expert by any means. Uh, there's different grades of oil. There's different bases they use. Uh, obviously, if we have synthetic or we have uh, conventional, uh, we'll, we'll go with synthetic because it's definitely the most common one. But the, re the refinement of the base oil is, will determine how big the particulates are of oil and then basically an oil company will add their additives and the, the the smaller the particulates are, the the more they can get to it, the longer the oil will last. So, um, you know, it, it, a lot of it is what oil they're you're using as far as where well, I I cautiously uh, am uh, very reserved in what I say of what oil or or anything like that um, because again I'm I'm not an oil expert on that, so I I don't. I just, again, a firm believer in a, a good quality oil. All right, sure, no, fair enough, Dan. Um, here's a good question for you, and I'll try and read this the best I can. With the newer engines running thinner and thinner oil and tighter bearing clearances, is this advantageous from a bearing longevity standpoint or purely for improved fuel mileage? Is there a benefit of tightening up clearances on older engines and running thinner oil? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so that's a, that definitely a two-part. Newer, newer design, yes. The the testing going in right now as thinner oils is 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 to me horrifying uh, to think that you know this is it, with the emission standards that the oil levels, the oil viscosities that we're going to be running are going to be almost like water in years to come. 
is hard to believe. So there's definitely an, an issue because the thinner the water, or the, thin, well, the water, the thinner the oil, the harder it is to create a hydrodynamic wedge to keep the crankshaft off of the bearings. Um, thin oil, it, when you when the engine fires, it, it wants to it wants to squeeze out as quick as possible, which uh, creates issues. In saying that, there's different overlays that we're doing uh, to combat that um, with different, uh, not your conventional lead-based overlays, which is why I primarily went over here on this one. So there's there's other ones to help will self-lubricate more so than sweating out the the components of the the conventional lead copper tin so uh it, it's it's a working process for the new vehicles uh the cool thing is a lot of the i'm working on some stuff now where the 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 components the overlay components we're doing there is where i'm looking at introducing them because they have a higher seizure resistance and is that practical to bring into earlier cars that 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 was not even an option years gone by and my answer to that is i believe so yes so that's something you know i am working on with with clevite bearings uh the second part of the question is if you have an older engine uh to to tighten it up that can be a little tricky um because you can change the vertical clearance and but the bearing again this goes back to uh, the other webinar I did where you talk about the eccentricity of the bearing and if if the eccentricity is too much it is specifically designed for a heavy based oil so let's say for instance you have a 2050 oil and you want to squeeze it through this funnel to create a wedge um, we want to change that eccentricity if we're going to go with 5w30 because again it's going to push out faster so um, typically you can get by with an older car that you're restoring or something like that you can tighten up vertical clearance you cannot change the eccentricity that's in the bearing design uh, you can change and help it but you'll never create it the same as a bearing design for a much thinner oil so you can get by with it um, the other issue is you have to be careful on older cars if the bearing only options are maybe full group bearings or or something like that um, you, you get so much oil hemorrhaging out of the the main bearings that you can't create enough oil pressure so you you have to be careful you you can never take it that extreme as a late mile car and run 530 in a 1970s design engine all right kate um another one here for you let me just scroll down um this is to do with assembly, and these are good questions as well. Um, is lubricating the back of the bearing okay, yes or no? Um, there really is not a purpose to lubricate the back of the bearing. So the bearing on, on any kind of rod journal, or rod, it's not journal, rod, or the main bore, uh, when you hone, you want a certain amount of, of crosshatch left in there for gripping. Uh, the purpose of oiling the back of a bearing would create a lubrication, which is counterproductive to holding the bearing stationary. I personally do not believe in lubricating the back of the bearing. Um, it, it's just, it gives it an opportunity to, to make it slicker, which is exactly what you don't want. You don't want the bearing moving around. So I really, I don't find an advantage of that. Um, we, on high frequency engines, there was some issues that I've seen where uh, the bearing would actually move within the housing bore, if, if he was referring to that, uh, something of the nine, 10,000 RPMs, the bearings actually start not rotating but they will actually move within uh the housing bore because of the frequency of the components going up and down and that's that's another that's another issue there but not many people are going to have 10,000 rpm engines 
All right, so then Dan, what about in regards to chamfering the back edge of the bearing or the parting line of the bearing? Will that, is that a yes or a no? So basically bearings are designed, um, a lot of the, the aftermarket bearings are based off the same print going into the production line. Um, I'll, I'll say this first, when the engines go into production line, there, there's no change, there's no zero change made to the bearing. Bearing is made to function out of the box. We make all the necessary chamfers adjustments uh, to clearance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the chamfer parting lines, uh, I, I'm, I will say I'm personally was guilty of that. Uh, you know, coming on from the engine side, as most of you out there, and now coming on the engineering side of manufacturing, I, 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 I've been blessed to have the a well-rounded knowledge of of why and what. So it's a lot. You know, I've learned a lot coming here. Um, the the oil leakage, you're all you're doing in. Keep in mind the bore relief is there to make sure that your parting lines don't don't butt the crankshaft. So there's already relief there. Okay, so if people are chamfering it for um, whatever reason, uh, there, it's already designed in the bearing not to pinch off the crankshaft at the parting line. The only exception, I know some people, and, and I'm not going to say yes or no if it works great uh on a particular thrust bearing i i know people are trying to feed more oil to the rear of the thrust uh, i get that concept um you know you, you're trying to get all in there keep in mind in, in a thrust bearing and we did not go over thrust bearing failures um but a thrust bearing if you have a flat crank and a flat thrust pad where it's hitting on if you put two flat surfaces together you cannot get oil between two flat surfaces. It creates a perfect hydrodynamic seal. Um, diesel injection pumps, prime example, they're made it metal to metal with a clamp force on there, not the leak. Same in reverse for a, a, a crankshaft thrust bearing. If you have a flat thrust face against a flat thrust bearing and it's sitting on there, you can chamfer the porting lines all you want. You're not getting any more oil in there. That oil has to come through while the crank is off of the thrust face. So I'm not a big fan of any more of, of modifying the bearings because they're they're specifically done. Grant, there are some cases where if you have an aftermarket crank or some different rods and you're trying to change something, you we, we address the hitting on the fillet area, um, you know, there may be something there that you you may have to chamfer a little bit on the edges uh, on a custom build, something like that. But keep in mind the bearings were in the aftermarket are designed after the same ones that went in the vehicle in the OEM, and and no one no one had to mess with those. All right, um, Dan, is there a is there a particular particle size, you know, maximum size that a bearing can absorb? It depends on the overlay of the bearing. Again, the none is the best. Um, if anything that can get in there, that's a that's it's a tough one to answer because any particulate that gets in a bearing is going to disrupt the oil film. Now, how much disruption there is uh, is is enough particulate that it's that it create a roadblock per se that it the oil has to detour that's very extreme to as minimal as uh, I got a small little scratch in there, a small little scratches. In, in, in all reality is cosmetic and in, in the engines, it's not going to fail because of it. So uh, there's not, there's a lot riding on that. How thick is the oil film? Uh, and that's, that's a stack up of oil clearance. Um, deflection in a rod slash block, uh, cylinder pressure, oil wedge, viscosity oil, there's a stack up. So to say that X micron would create an issue and, and XX micron would not, um, I can't, that it's based strictly based off of the engine itself. Okay, super. Um, so Dan, 
would using a high performance bearing on a stock application build a better result and better longevity? Typically, yes. Um, uh, a performance bearing will have more crush uh, by design because it's made to, for a higher frequency. Uh, a performance bearing and, a, and our performance bearings are all CAS. Again, on the other webinar, I discussed CAS and centered bearings. Uh, great information. Uh, a CAS bearing is 20 to 30 percent stronger. You, you're put as a reliability engineer, I'm always thinking about reliability, reliability, uh, margin on parts. Uh, you, typically speaking, yes, you, you would get more, um, more reliability, more margin by using a performance bearing. It comes at a cost. Um, it, it costs more to make a cast bearing than it does a centered bearing, but it's a, cons it's a considerably stronger bearing. Uh, for example, the, the P bearing, our P bearing, versus our H bearing, uh, the, the overlays are basically the same. The big difference is what you can't see, it's the substrate. So in saying that, you know, get more crush with the performance bearing, uh, the bearing's gone, the overlay is the same. So the embeddability is the, it's a little less on the conformability side because it is a little more rigid bearing. So that was just a few little things, but typically speaking, um, yes, a performance bearing would put more margin in the bearing. Now there's there's also a, a higher higher end, uh, which is a lead indium overlay, and that not so much on a streetable engine because simply the fact that it's that bearing is designed for some high cylinder pressures, and it won't give you the longevity that you're looking for for a rebuild and because it's not that's not the purpose of that bearing it has a whole lot more conformability too much for a street application so again there's my email if, if somebody has questions uh again you know what type or whatever it's you know there's a there, I'm, I'm a resource for that sure no i appreciate that um and dan have you have you seen any additional wear caused by today's newer cars that feature stop start stop technology or even hybrids that have many more starts sort of starts during its life cycle have you seen anything that way at all absolutely um i have some fea studies on crank deflection every time the and from when the engine is statically when you pull up a stop sign when the engine is statically uh the deflection of the crankshaft to 400 rpms to 1000 rpms and at every point when that end not typically speaking when and when that engine stops there's deflection of camshaft pulling the the nose of the crank upward and as the engine progresses in rpms uh it becomes more neutral and it gets builds a wedge in saying that so every time that engine starts it is putting considerably more load on, on the bearing itself the upper creating an issue of building that wedge until it becomes at a frequency where it it pulls itself back into a neutral status so definitely definitely seeing an, an issue um typically speaking a, a start stop technology would would not be the conventional lead base because of the melting points that's where we were as i was alluding to a little earlier uh, there's other overlays that are available for those, um, and they create a considerably higher seizure resistance. Uh, and when when you can, if I can incorporate that on some other bearings, this is one of the projects I'm working on. But there there's new materials, new overlays out there that are a higher seizure resistance that we keep striving and working towards. Yes, for that particular reason. Okay. Yep. So there again, how, you know, application and bearing cho and, you know, choosing the right bearing is super important there for sure. Yes. Um, okay. So here's one, Dan, that we get on the tech line quite often. Um, and uh, so do bearing, do the, do the bearing location lugs help in any way to prevent the bearing from spinning in the housing or is this solely the function of oil bearing crush? Oh, of oil, sorry. Or is this solely the function of bearing crush? The, the the tangs we design tangs and bearings strictly as a locator um 
to put them in the location to, to by design, then it does in, in a main, you would send, it would be centered between the radius of the crankshaft to the, the rods, it would be pulled off enough off one side that the bearing would not get into the radius of the crankshaft. The, the locating tangs and I key on the locating are there is there's no there is no functionality in design to keep them from spinning that is strictly by the bearing standoff that's designed which basically it puts uh the 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 load of the bearing as you clamp it down the standoff then has to fit in that housing bore and the pressure that that applies to the bore uh, will keep that bearing from spinning. And that's kind of goes back to the previous question about oiling the back of the bearing. That's another reason why you wouldn't want to do that because um, in, in our in our uh, database, when we figure out crush, uh, we figure it based off of a dry bearing on a dry component rod block. And this is the pressure that we want on there. So adding any kind of lubricity would, would be uh, you know, more counterproductive, but the, the tang is, is strictly a locating tang only. And, and, and to go with that, some of the newer designs, they, we don't even have tangs at all that are, that are in the bearing. So you, you have to, you center them up and, and move on. And it, the, the clamp load is, is exactly the same with or without. All right, super. Um... We've got a couple more here for you, Dan, and then what we'll do is we'll respect everybody's time. Obviously, we, everybody's got to get back to work and probably back to the shop, and I'm sure you, you've you got to get back to work, but um, a couple more here for you. Sure. Um, this particular gentleman, yeah, this gentleman's asked, you know, what would cause a copper color on the back of a tri-metal bearing? And they've used an example like a CB745HXN as an example. Yeah, it's, that's, that's a great question. Um, and I don't have an answer. I, I've had a conversation with somebody else on that um, because the, the steel backing is exactly that, it's steel. So I don't, on the back side, theoretically and technically it's impossible to get substrate through a steel backing to get onto, onto the back. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, again, I just had a conversation with, uh, with someone on this um i'm not I, I won't say it doesn't happen um but i i cannot point a finger into the bearing as far as how substrate would sneak around behind the back side of the bearing that has that hoop strength uh to keep it clamped on there and the bearing not have a serious amount of fretting on there um yeah i i think i know where this question's coming from and i'll take this offline yeah, no worries. I'll I'll just we'll just mention to them that uh, make sure that they get your contact information and we'll we'll do that for sure. Um, another question is, uh, can the H series bearings be run on a cast iron or steel crankshaft rods or mains without causing any issues? You know, there's there's a lot of conversations back and forth on that, um, and I have some people that say yes, and I have some people that say no. Um, you know, again, the the overlay between the H and the P really isn't isn't any difference. Um, and I have I don't have supportive data either way. I have feedback from the field uh, via engine builders, via uh, crank manufacturers that say, hey, we you know th those don't work. Um, and you know my there's a lot of unanswered there about you know which is is the crank ground is, is there you know the fuzz that we we refer to uh, of grinding directional is, is there fuzz there that you can't measure with a um you know a profilometer that's actually and i, I had some of those bearings pictured in here that did that um theoretically uh you know the the H with the overlay is is very compatible with the P bearing overlay, which the P bearing runs on cast cranks all the time. All right. 
So Dan, one more question for you, and then uh, and then like I say, anybody else has got questions that we didn't get a chance to get to you, or uh, or you have questions, uh, put them in the questions box, and we'll make sure that Dan gets them here when we're all finished. And uh, so Dan, this particular gentleman's asked, you know, what is the desired finish on the ID of the rod housing bore? Ah, uh, yeah, that, you know, it's one of those. Um, I don't have an exact RA, RZ number on that. Um, I know personally, we, we've, there were some rod manufacturers that had stuff that was very slick and, and we found again that it was, it was very, um, it didn't have enough grip. So you, you want to leave some heavy cross hatch in it so it can, it has grip because it, when, if you get too smooth, um, it, it wants to slide around. So you, you need to break um, in honing a rod, you need to, or, or a main, either one, you need to make sure that it has a, a fairly rough texture. So, um, you know, I, again, I don't, I don't have, we're cautious on telling people what, how to hone, um, you know, most of the honing questions or something like that. Um, I, I refer on to you know Sun and a Rottler or somebody like that. That would that would be more advisable of what stones to use. Um, is is where I refer those to. Okay. Yeah. No. Fair enough, Dan. Um, so that kind of wraps things up as far as question wise. Um, Dan, you're you're always a wealth of information. Uh, we always appreciate it. I'm sure even on the tech line, we bug you far more than you have time for. We always appreciate it because you're uh, you're kind of our go-to for this kind of stuff. And um, I know a few people on uh, that had questions here even today have got, they've even mentioned they've got your email address and they're going to send you some photos. So um, again, we really appreciate your time. Excellent presentation. And uh, we'll try not to bug you too much moving forward. How does that sound? <laughs> Uh, it's always a privilege to work with you guys, Rob. I, I thank you. Get, thank you for the opportunity to hear today. And and I can't say enough, guys, if gentlemen, ladies uh, who is out there, if you know, if I could be of assistance to you, uh, you know, I'm, I'm huge on the education part here and try to help in, in any way I can. Feel free to reach out to me. Great. Yeah, no, thank you, Dan. Um, so what we'll do now is uh, we're going to go back to Amanda just here real quick and we'll just wrap things up and uh, let everybody get on with their day. So I'll go back to Amanda. And lastly, if you need to get a hold of anyone at AERA, you can see our contact info is there. You can either call us via phone or shoot an email to either Rob or myself. And if we can't answer it, we'll get it in the right hands, whether that be Dan or somebody else. So thanks again, everybody. We truly appreciate you taking time out of your busy day and we hope you all have a great afternoon.